So good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well. In today's uh, session, which is my lecture number 96 of my lecture series, I'm going to take you all through some case-based scenarios, which will help us uh, go through the latest guidelines, which is published. Uh, it is a joint clinical practice guideline pub published uh, in the Endocrine Society, as well as from the European Society of Endocrinology. And this is surrounding pre-existing diabetes and pregnancy. Uh, this is a very important set of guidelines for the upcoming exams, uh, specialty certificate as well as European board and the other endocrinology exams across the world. And of course, it's an extremely important set of guidelines for clinical practice as well. So as I mentioned, uh, the learning objectives for this particular session is I'll be applying the 2025 guidelines recommendations to certain clinical cases. So it will help us remember these guidelines easily and uh, we'll see the case-based approach for these guidelines. We will look at understanding the management of GLP-1 receptor agonist surrounding uh, the conception and when should we, we consider stopping that. The role of metformin, especially in insulin-treated type 2 diabetics uh, role of CGM versus uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose. We'll look at the uh, blood glucose targets. We'll also look at the timing of the delivery. And we'll also look at uh, briefly about the advice as regards the postpartum care in patients with pre-existing diabetes mellitus uh, as endorsed in this guidelines. Uh, we'll do this by doing some case-based scenarios, which will be MCQ-based. So it will enhance your MCQ solving skills as well. So let's start right away for the first case. So this is surrounding the GLP-1 receptor agonist use preconception. Of course, there is an increasing number of population now uh, which are using uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist like uh, semaglutide uh, and also the GLP-1 and GIP-1 receptor agonist, which is the trisepatide. And um, it's very important that we should know when uh, we should advise the patients of stopping this when they are trying to conceive. So here we have a, in the question stem a 34-year-old woman. She has history of type 2 diabetes. She is well established on semaglutide, one milligram, which she takes weekly. She's also on metformin, and she is also on basal insulin, which she takes once a day. She's coming to your clinic, expressing the desire to conceive in the next few months. Her BMI is 36 kg per meter square. Uh, her HBNC is 6.8% and she is otherwise healthy. So the question now is, the, what is the best approach regarding GLP-1 receptor agonist advice for her? Should we continue her semaglutide until pregnancy is confirmed and then stop it? Should we switch to deglutec for better weight loss before pregnancy? Uh, sorry, should we switch to duraglutide for better weight loss before pregnancy? Should we discontinue GLP-1 receptor agonist before conception and optimize her insulin? Or should we continue semaglutide until the end of first trimester? Or should we stop all non-insulin agents immediately? So the correct answer for this is we discontinue the GLP-1 receptor agonist before conception and we should optimize her insulin. So the guidelines recommend stopping GLP-1 receptor agonist well before conception, not waiting for confirmation of pregnancy because there is a risk of placenta transfer and potential teratogenicity. So what is the recommended duration for the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the GIP-1 receptor agonist uh, to be stopped? So semaglutide, as advised, should be stopped at least four to eight weeks. This is the washout period before we start conceiving. Tirzapatide, at least more than or equal to four weeks. And liraglutide and dulaglutide, approximately four weeks as well. So all these agents are recommended to be stopped before trying to conceive. What's important to keep in mind, though, is when we discontinue this GLP-1 receptor agonist, there will be increase in the blood sugars and the patient may have weight gain. And this may further increase the risk for congenital malformations and spontaneous abortion. So timely transition and titration of alternative antihypoglycemic agents after discontinuing the GLP-1 receptor agonist should be done. The timing of discontinuation prior to Pregnancy is individualized based on anticipated likelihood of conception after discontinuing contraception. Type of GLP-1 receptor agonist use and risk of prolonged time off GLP-1 receptor agonist prior to pregnancy. Uh, 
Active management is definitely required for the glycemia after GLP-1 receptor uh, Agon is discontinuous. So these are all uh, clearly described in this 2025 guidelines. Now, second question stem is, is continuous glucose monitoring better or is it self-monitoring of blood glucose better? So, 32-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes, she's already on insulin, is 18 weeks pregnant. She asks about using a CGM instead of checking capillary blood glucose, which we generally advise the patient to check at least four times a day, like the fasting reading and one hour post all the meals. So what is the best advice according to the guideline? So CGM is recommended and superior to self-monitoring of blood glucose. Either CGM or uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose can be used. Only self-monitoring of blood glucose is recommended in type 2 diabetes. CGM is contraindicated during pregnancy or use CGM target, but target less than 140 milligram per DL throughout the day. So what is the best advice according to guidelines for this patient? Correct answer is either CGM or self-monitoring of blood glucose can be used. As evidence for superiority of uh, CGM in type 2 diabetes in pregnancy is limited. Targets should follow standing uh, standard uh, fasting and postprandial goals and not just a single 24-hour CGM threshold. So what are the targets we are talking about? Uh, as mentioned as mentioned in the recommendations uh, number seven of these guidelines, in individuals with pre-existing diabetes mellitus using a continuous uh, CGM, we suggest against the use of a single 24-hour CGM threshold of less than 140 milligram per deciliter, which is less than 7.8 millimole per liter, in place of standard of care pregnancy glucose targets of fasting less than 95, this is preferred. Uh, these are uh, better off. I mean, uh, less than 95. One hour uh, PPBS should be less than 140, which is less than 7.8. And if you're checking two hours, then it should be less than 120 milligram per deciliter, which is less than 6.7 millimole per liter. So when CGM is used in individuals with pre-existing diabetes, providers and patients should use fasting and post glucose targets as the basis for insulin adjustment and not rely on a single CGM threshold or a single glucose target of 63 to 140 milligram per DL as per the CGM. When using CGM in conjunction with uh, the, the healthcare provider, the provider should be aware that not all algorithms can meet these targets. This recommendation applies to all types of pre-existing diabetes mellitus, including type 1 as well as type 2. So some important points about this, and this is what we should keep in mind. Now, case number 3 is a 29-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes. She's 10 weeks pregnant and she's on insulin, glargine and metformin. She has no renal impairment and her HbA1c is 6.5% done at the baseline during the first trimester, which is at 10 weeks of pregnancy. Now, according to 2025 guidelines, what is the most appropriate action regarding metformin? So this is a type 2 diabetic patient. She's already on insulin, plus she's on metformin. So what is the recommendation regarding continuation of metformin? Should we continue metformin to reduce insulin dose? Should we stop metformin? Should we continue both medications as standard? Should we consider stopping metformin due to limited benefits? And should we increase metformin to improve the uh, low for gestational age outcomes? The correct answer as per the guidelines is uh, in my complete lecture. And here the free view has ended. If you like access to my full session, which is my lecture number 96. Please subscribe to my lecture series. You can simply email me at mazirules at gmail.com and or you can WhatsApp me on 0097155 743 4794. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much.